Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. My name is Matt Solomon. I'm the Director of Marketing at WPS. I want to welcome you to our speaker series on sustaining your resilience in stressful times. When we develop a new test at WPS, our goal is to bring an author's idea to life, answer a researcher's question, meet a clinician's need, and ideally change an individual's life for the better. I want to just review some quick housekeeping items. If you have questions, please feel free to enter them in either the chat box or the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Today, I'm honored to introduce Sam Goldstein as our speaker. Sam has authored, co-authored, and edited over 54 trade and science books, including the Encyclopedia of Child Development and Handbook of Resilience in Children. He's also the co-author of seven neuropsychological and psychological tests, including the Risk Inventory and Strengths Evaluation, or RISE, published by WPS. In addition, he's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Attention Disorders and clinical faculty at the University of Utah School of Medicine as Director of Neurology at the Learning and Behavior Center. Thank you so much, Sam, and welcome. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay, and Laura, if there are any problems with the broadcast, just uh, jump in and let me know. Uh, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, this is the second in a three-part uh, presentation. If you missed the first part, you can go on to my website under webinars and click on a link that will take you to uh, the WPS posting of uh, the first part of this uh, three-part series. In the first part, uh, I focused uh, heavily on understanding how uh, a pandemic that is a stressful chronic event, not something that happens once and then we cope with it, but something that continues to exert an influence on us over a period of time. Uh, we talked some about how people cope with that, both children and adults. I introduced the idea of a, a syndrome going back to post 9-11 and what happened to some people relative to mental health. I talked about COVID, the coronavirus stress syndrome, which is not a disorder and not a diagnosis, but conceptually, uh, trying to help us understand what happens uh, uh, to some people, uh, but in some ways happens uh, to all of us, but some people clearly more so than others. Today, I wanna focus uh, uh, a bit more on understanding this idea of resilience. Why has it become so popular? Is it in fact <clears throat> a scientific concept? Uh, should we include it in the work we do uh, edu in education, in mental health, uh, and in our communities. It's become a very popular concept, which leads it sometimes to be uh, equally misunderstood. And I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the research that's looked at both risk and protection uh, to help you appreciate that uh, risk alone doesn't tell us uh, the course uh, of an individual, uh, but in fact, their assets uh, are in most cases much better predictors of where they go in time when children transition into adult life, uh, we don't uh, ask about their worst academic subject or their most annoying behaviors. It's their assets that get them where they go. And we are increasingly uh, appreciative and recognize that the more liabilities you have, the more important these assets become. So I wanna summarize these assets for you so that in your work, uh, you'll have a way of conceptualizing and understanding what are these protective factors? What are the risk factors I should focus on during the course of uh, assessment and evaluation? I wanna point out a number of uh, commercially uh, available programs. I say commercially, meaning they're available on the web, but you don't have to pay for them uh, that I think are excellent resources to help you uh, as you return to working with children in the schools or in your mental health practices or even for parents as they work with youth. And then at the very end, I want to introduce the idea of tenacity uh, and the research that Bob Brooks and I have been doing in preparation of a new book. Uh, the third part of this series will focus on uh, tenacity and the seven instincts that uh, we believe make us human and, and make us who we are. So let's get started and see how far we go. Uh, I think we can all agree the purpose of life is to prepare the next generation for their future. Our genes really don't care if we're happy or sad, if we have a good time or a poor time. Our genes have a primary goal. They want to move from an older body into a younger body. This is the prime uh, directive uh, in uh, life. Uh, 
uh, but not all species uh, share equally in this preparation process. So uh, consider for a moment uh, salmon and snakes. So their offspring are born with sufficient instinct to survive. Very little learning takes place in order for them to survive. Salmon and snakes, as far as we're aware, uh, really don't uh, require a maternal uh, or paternal figures. Uh, they don't need parents or schools. Uh, they are born with enough instinct to know where to go, what to eat, and how to survive. Consider more complex species like bear cubs. They take one or two years with a mother. Uh, why uh, two parents for a bear cub uh, isn't good is hard to understand, <clears throat> but somehow Papa Bear sees the bear cubs as a threat and will uh, injure if not kill them. But bear cubs need one or two years with uh, a parent. They have some instincts in what to do and how to do it, but require a parent figure uh, to show them and model and teach them what to do before they go on their way. Higher primates like those you see in the picture on the slide, uh, they require three or four years before they're ready to transition into adulthood. And we humans, we who have considered ourselves uh, above and beyond all species, our children nowadays take 30 years till they're ready to grow up. Now the slide says 10, uh, 30 is my uh, offhand comment uh, given the complexities of the world today. Uh, but 10 is about the, the age <coughs> for most religions when children are considered to be responsible for their sins uh, and no longer do their parents intervene. Uh, at 10, children are capable of surviving. There are millions of children, 10 and older, survive uh, in poverty uh, on the streets of, of many cities worldwide. Uh, under 10, it's hard for children to do. Uh, so human development uh, requires many, many years of preparation. Children are born with some instincts, but the the majority of the knowledge they have to acquire uh, in order uh, to transition successfully into adult life comes with experience over time. And it doesn't all come in the genes. So we can argue that children don't require a model to walk. They will get up and walk absent any observation, but they will not speak uh, without a model. They will not socialize without a model. So uh, genes for complex behaviors uh, set the stage, uh, determine the opportunity, and experience determines where we go on, the, on, on that stage. And in genetics, we have a concept called multifinality, meaning the same genes can end up driving different aspects of behavior uh, based upon experience. Uh, we've perpetuated the 19th century perception that raising children is a process by which we dump inf information into that black box of the brain, uh, to quote Noam Chomsky's uh, explanation of language, uh, and out comes uh, whatever we want uh, in terms of what we're trying to teach, whether it's language or socialization or reading or math, uh, whatever it is, that there's this box that takes this information in and somehow churns it up and spits it out. We've also assumed a Stepford wife model, meaning if you remember the movie, we've assumed that every brain is the same <coughs> and that all black boxes are identical, uh, hence, the generic nature of our schools. Uh, we group kids together by uh, age, uh, by ability, uh, by need, um, under the assumption uh, that their brains may be the same. We've now come to learn that that couldn't be further from the truth, and that which makes us unique may be um, even more important than that which we share uh, with others. As I mentioned in the last presentation, my philosophy is that all children share qualities with every child uh, in terms of their basic physical abilities or basic uh, cognitive abilities. They have qualities that are unique to them. The combinations of, of our genes lead us to each be somewhat unique and qualities that they share with groups. And sometimes those groups are assets. They learn quickly, they behave well. Sometimes those groups provide risk. They struggle to learn. Uh, they're overactive or impulsive. And my philosophy is that the more risks you have, the more assets you need. In some research studies, two assets uh, for every risk. Uh, and uh, the more important those assets become, because those very same assets predict outcome for all children. And thus, they're even more important for children at risk. This phenomena, my theory here, helps us appreciate and understand 
why despite our best efforts, children with specific diagnoses like ADHD or learning disability <coughs> or depression or anxiety, why treatment tends to lead to symptom relief, but we've yet to find in longitudinal studies that treatment alone dramatically alters outcome. So uh, treatment uh, is good for symptom relief. Uh, we know that about uh, the use of medications to treat uh, ADHD, that they're very good when used in an appropriate and judicious way in reducing uh, symptoms and symptom severity and thereby reducing impairment. But we also know that over time, uh, children who take medication do not necessarily fare dramatically better uh, than those who don't take medication and also suffer from uh, ADHD. Uh, there I am going off to kindergarten. Uh, one of the two instincts that Bob and I have been looking at is that we think contributes to why children embrace the idea of school is that they're intuitively optimistic. Uh, we believe uh, that if we try, we will succeed, and we're <clears throat> intrinsically motivated that the act of engaging in the task uh, in and of itself is sufficient reinforcement. And I think that's why children embrace the opportunity to go off to school. And for most children, their experiences reinforce those two instincts and, and nurture them. But for children who struggle <coughs> in school, uh, those uh, two instincts are quickly extinguished. And as many children who've struggled in school have told me, they just don't think they're smart enough. They don't think they're capable enough. And in an effort to encourage them, the adults in their lives provide uh, extrinsic uh, consequences, rewards, or sometimes punishments uh, in exchange for doing the work. And if the work doesn't get done, uh, the reward is not uh, granted, the punishment is provided. But in the end, it externalizes that which should be an internalizing process. We see this now with homeschooling, not just with kids who have special needs, uh, but kids who don't have special needs, a significant percentage uh, from what I've been told from friends and the siblings of patients we see here at the clinic, uh, that they're struggling. And they're struggling because school uh, for many kids is something they have to do and must do, often for the extrinsic uh, reinforcement of grades. And when left to their own devices, as in home, because uh, what we're seeing now is is schooling at home, not really homeschooling. Parents really don't know what to do. Uh, we're seeing a lot of kids uh, struggle. Uh, this is a picture that was given to me uh, by a parent. And I ask parents to bring pictures. Nowadays, parents have their phones and can show me pictures of their kids. This is preschool graduation in a suburb of Salt Lake City where I am now uh, and where our clinic has been for 40 years. Uh, and the children are in a suburb. You can see they're uh, blonde-haired, most of them. Uh, this particular area of Salt Lake has a lot of Scandinavian uh, immigrants who came uh, to the Salt Lake Valley uh, over the last hundred years. Uh, and they're, they're singing a series of songs uh, that they have dutifully rehearsed. And you can see uh, they stand there, they have the respect for the teacher and the self-discipline and the self-regulation to stand still. And by the way, more brain cells have to fire to stand or to sit still than to move the human brain programs us to keep uh, moving. Uh, otherwise, up until just recently, adversity might befall us. And uh, the mom gave me this picture. Her daughter was in this preschool class. Her daughter was about to become a preschool dropout. Uh, she couldn't keep her bottom on the carpet square. Uh, she had a box of 24 crayons when preschool began. Uh, but by this point, she had two or three crayons in the box and had no idea where the others had gone. And, and I'll ask you to take a look at the three boys on the left. You know, these kids are not that excited about singing these songs. You look at the boys on the left, Mo, Larry, and Curly there, uh, uh, watching and, and waiting and singing the song. But these kids have the self-discipline to do it. I asked this mom, which of these children uh, was hers? And again, I've always asked parents to show me pictures. I like to listen to what they say as they describe the picture or to look at their faces. And some parents, in, at least that come to our clinic, are terribly uh, burned out on their children's challenges. And so I went down the line of those children and asked, uh, is this your daughter, is this one? And mom said, oh, my daughter's not in that picture. And I wondered what adversity had befallen the child or what great crime the child had committed uh, that precluded her from participating in this preschool 
uh, graduation. Now I'm so old, I went to school in New York City in the 60s. I'm so old that uh, uh, we didn't have preschool. Uh, and now we have pre preschool, the mother toddler groups. Uh, and uh, the mom showed me another picture. And before I could say much of anything, she said, there she is way up there on the hill. And the hill was adjacent to the preschool uh, behind the park where they were, <clears throat> where they were doing this graduation. And the mom took this picture and, and then went and got the child. And I don't want to pathologize or demonize or moralize this child, but it's interesting how we ha have set certain expectations uh, for children and children who are at the ends of the bell curve, particularly the end in which they fall short, uh, we have tended to pathologize. And words are powerful because as a preschooler, this child is described as a little restless. As a kindergartner, she'll be described as hyperactive and as a first grader, likely uh, impulsive and inattentive. Uh, and we're probably describing uh, the same behavior. You can call someone careful. You can also call them uh, slow. And, and the words you choose, the semantics uh, you assign makes a significant difference in how you interact with a child. And, and maybe this is an opportunity as children return to school, perhaps to rethink you know, this, this kind of pathologi pathologization, that's a tough word, of, uh, of our children. You know, are a lot of the problems children experience, are they really pathologies or simply falling to the bottom of a bell curve uh, at which point slow uh, isn't fast enough? So I don't think biology is destiny, but I do think it affects probability. And as I pointed out, I think there are children in those risk groups. We know that with ADHD, depression, anxiety, a learning disability, even autism, that there are children in those risk groups who despite their adversities, manage to, to, to accumulate experiences in life that lets them transition successfully and functionally. And, and I call it the one third rule because if you pick a risk group in general, about one third, whether it's ADHD or high functioning autism, meaning autism with normal intellect, if you follow those kids into adulthood, about one third fare well, and about one third really struggle and about one third is sort of in uh, the middle. And you can't predict who will fare well based on efforts to reduce risk based on treatment alone. As I pointed out, treatment may uh, in some positive ways uh, give you a, a better level of functioning currently, but it hasn't been found to change long-term outcome, which is why in the last 70 years, we've looked for other variables uh, and, and that falls under this umbrella or umbrella of resilience or strengths. Um, I do want to point out briefly this idea of instincts. We have, for a very long period of time, uh, ignored uh, instincts in children. We have assumed, uh, despite knowing better, that children are tabula rasas. Uh, we have resisted the idea that they're homunculi, like a rose unfolding. They're immutable. Nothing we do can impact them. And we tend to favor the tabula rasa, meaning they're a blank slate, and whatever their experiences are, shape what happens to them. We know better, and while biology is not destiny, it has a significant impact on probability. And, and we know that children are born with certain instincts. Here are some examples. I'll tell you uh, 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 quickly about some of them. We don't have the time to go through all of them, but for example, the drive to help. Young children wanna help. One of my famous, uh, uh, one of the famous studies I really like from the Max Planck Institute of Behavioral Genetics in Germany uh, takes a four-year-old child with a researcher and they're sitting across from a table engaged in an activity. The researcher drops his pen and most of these four-year-old children, <coughs> these are developmentally normal children, <coughs> most of them get out of the chair without being asked and pick up the pen and hand it back. And some children get out of the chair multiple times and never glare at the examiner, never ask, how many times are you going to do that? Why don't you stop doing that? They just keep doing it. Interestingly enough, uh, in that institute, they did the same research with chimps. And chimps would also get out of the chair and uh, pick up the pen. They didn't always give it back. They usually put it in their mouths. Uh, but they have that same uh, drive to help. Uh, and at, at the end of the talk today, I'll come back. Uh, and touch on the seven that Bob and I think are really essential to make us who we are as humans. Um, uh, the idea of altruism, 
a giving of yourself, the need for social connections and fairness. If you stop and think about it, why are we so concerned about things being fair? Not just uh, the adults uh, around us, but our children as well. Why is fairness such a big deal for us? And I'm going to argue that it's it's uh, built into our genes. Uh, this is a concern for us. And, and if things favor us, we're more than happy about that. And if they don't, uh, this idea of fairness and lack of fairness really troubles us. Uh, if we talk about this idea of resilience and go back in time, uh, Anne Frank wrote in her diary about schooling, and there was a young girl who, uh, there's probably some genetics to resilience. We'll define it here in a minute. Uh, this idea of functioning well under adversity, which she seemed to do. Uh, the, the first interest in this uh, was a woman named Demi Werner, who since, uh, I believe, passed away and she was in California. And Emmy has studied uh, a group of 600 uh, children born into poverty on the island of Kauai. She began those studies in 1950. And she wrote a book every 10 years about uh, what really made a difference for them, what kinds of variables made a difference. And in the long run, it was assets <clears throat> that made a difference for those uh, youth uh, and not so much liabilities. And, and Anne Frank wrote about this, and then she's credited with <clears throat> the concept of the tree bending in the wind. Uh, she wrote about that, and as far as I'm aware, she was the first one. And she wrote this after she'd been in hiding for, you know, they were in hiding for over 700 days. And what's ironic is that uh, there isn't a single formula to define resilience. It's a group of variables, <clears throat> I'll show you, that occur within the person within the immediate environment, hence the family, and within uh, the community, hence the, the, the area around you and the culture that defines the community. Uh, and uh, when you look at those three sets of variables, uh, for some people, some are more important than others. There's no single formula. Uh, and for Anne Frank, it appeared to be her optimism and her humor and her willingness to give of herself to help others, and she passed away in the concentration camp soon after her sister uh, passed away, and there was no one else for her to take care of, uh, which was quite tragic. And if you haven't been uh, to Amsterdam to the Anne Frank House or haven't read her book, it's really worth reading. So what is this idea of resilience that Emmy Werner first began writing about in the 1950s? Uh, and Emmy noticed that there were children post-World War II in, in Europe uh, some of whom uh, seemed to weather the adversity. Again, these were not just kids in concentration camps. Uh, these were <coughs> children of, of people who were living in Europe at the time, weren't in, uh, in the camps. Uh, she noticed that some children were able to play and get on with their lives, and some were terribly uh, traumatized. And she first used this term. And resilience has always been seen as a material science term, uh, a process by which a particular material can stretch and return to its original shape when the forces that are pushed against it are removed. So originally it was seen as some kind of process that allowed you to have good outcome despite high risk, to function competently under stress, which is really the key. You don't know if someone's resilient until you put them in an adverse situation and see what happens to them over time. And finally, it's the ability to recover from uh, trauma uh, and adversity uh, and, and get on with your life. But the key component is the one in the middle there, uh, functioning well under stress. And, and you'll see the kids you work with, even your own children, your friends and colleagues, uh, some people despite stress and adversity are able to continue moving forward uh, uh, quite positively. It's not that they're unaffected, it's that they're able to manage the stress in such a way that it doesn't cause impairment. And others are easily overwhelmed. And certainly, pre-existing issues or conditions, having depression and being exposed to stress, having anxiety and being exposed to stress, uh, suffering from PTSD from another stressor, and then having a new stressor, all of those will likely uh, increase your risk. If we look at the four waves of resilience research, beginning with Emmy Werner's work, and Anne Mastin very succinctly defines this, 
uh, the first wave of research beginning in the 50s just looked at person and variable factors. So the question that might be asked, and again, it wasn't clinical, it was just research-based, uh, is it better to have one parent or two parents? Let's look at children coming from each of those homes and see how they're doing. And the second wave of research began looking at the relationship, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the relationship of one variable to another. Hence, is it better to have two parents who yell and scream or one parent uh, who is calm and, and uh, collected. So we're looking at how the different variables impact each other, which is what we tried to do when we created the RISE, when David and I created the RISE, to look at how uh, protective factors minimize the adversity of risky behavior. Uh, three, the third wave of research that began in the 90s, uh, began to look at, can we apply this to an individual child? If we understand what kinds of factors led to positive outcomes, say, for children who were traumatized or children raised in homes with chronic alcoholics or mothers who suffered from chronic mental illness? Uh, are there some children who fared well over time and managed to go on to have fairly normal lives? If there are those children, uh, are there enough similarities in their experiences that we can manualize it and teach it to the next group of children? And where we are now, we're attempting to create community-wide programs. So we are now <clears throat> at a point over the last 15 years of asking the question, not how do we help an individual child at risk, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got, we've got uh, a pretty bad pollen here this year. Um, how do we help a child uh, at risk, uh, but how do we help all children? How to create uh, parenting programs, community-wide programs, school-based social-emotional learning programs, which have become very popular uh, and for which WPS is uh, going to introduce a, a further series focused on uh, social-emotional learning over the coming year. But how do we create programs that can benefit everyone, not just uh, children at risk? Dan Siegel, in his book, The Developing Mind, wrote that we caregivers which includes all of us that interact with children, educators, coaches, parents, uh, are the architects of the ways in which our genes uh, <clears throat> express themselves. Uh, and that expression is experience dependent. And the example <clears throat> that I like to use uh, is Tiger Woods. Uh, would he be uh, a golfer today had his father not taken an interest in golfing? or would he be doing something else? Uh, genes uh, can't express themselves without a push uh, from the environment. And the 10% we caregivers influence the 90% that is biological makes a 100% difference, uh, it is my opinion, in the ultimate lives of our children. And I'll say that again. Uh, the research on identical twins helps us appreciate that 90% of who we are is in our genes. But the 10% that we can influence as caregivers, how those genes express themselves, it is my belief, exerts nearly 100% influence on the course and quality of children's lives. Emerson said the secret of education lies in respecting the student. And for me, respecting the student doesn't, isn't just a matter of politeness, isn't just asking uh, please, or saying thank you, but rather making an effort to understand the child's abilities, <clears throat> the child's knowledge, their temperament, their needs, uh, their risks, <clears throat> and their strengths. Uh, and that as we turn schools inside out, which is what I hope we do over the next 50 years, and we begin to examine this process of preparing children for adult life and preparing children to be functional adults, it is my hope that we take the time to understand each individual child, doesn't mean each child needs an IEP, uh, but that we provide an educational environment that begins with an understanding of each child rather than begins with a pre-programmed set of ideas of how every child uh, must learn. And for some children, the experience of growing up absent that success <coughs> uh, steals away uh, that uh, resilient uh, mindset. And, and Bob Brooks and I, uh, Bob and I have been working together for 30 years, and I have a slide at the end if we have time 
I'm astounded by how many things Bob and I have done together until I started making a list of it. But we, we coined the term a resilient mindset, uh, a, a set of ideas that one has about themselves, a set of behaviors that one utilizes in everyday life, and a view of the world that allows you uh, to cope with stress and adversity uh, in a way that leads to success. Um, I think resilience is predicted uh, by three set factors. Factors within the child, as in their uh, temperament. Some children uh, have very easy uh, going temperaments uh, and they're easier to deal with. This morning, <coughs> before I got on in the clinic uh, on this uh, webinar, uh, I did a number of intakes this morning. Uh, I see about 150 to 200 children a year for uh, neuropsychological evaluation. And the one child I saw this morning was unfortunately a victim of um, alcohol abuse uh, by uh, his mother in utero. Uh, and uh, he's now been adopted. And he, he clearly has a host of uh, learning disabilities and developmental needs, but his temperament was spared. He's a very pleasant child. People like being around him despite his struggles. I'll contra contrast that with a little boy I saw yesterday who uh, I, I just couldn't wait until the testing was done. Uh, and uh, why is that? Because uh, he wasn't really developmentally impaired, but he was so oppositional and so difficult that every minute with him uh, was a battle and a matter of compromise and rewards in an effort to find out what does he really know. So children, some children are endowed <coughs> with qualities of temperament and ultimately ways of thinking uh, that shape how they respond to the world and how we respond to them. Qualities within the family, that's a picture of my wife and I uh, with um, uh, four out of five, maybe that's all five of our kids there and a couple of their partners and a couple of our grandkids. So how we as families uh, influence <coughs> the expression of our children's genes and the experiences we provide. And finally, <clears throat> what the culture does, how the immediate community uh, su provides support. So what I have in this next series of slides, and we're gonna go through them pretty quickly, uh, is a summary, uh, and I've added to it as well, but a big part of the summary is from uh, SAMHSA and a study that was done in 2009, trying to identify all of the risks and protective factors by those three sets of variables that I just mentioned, person, community, and family, uh, in an effort to someday create an algorithm, uh, meaning a, a, a balanced formula that we can use. I, I look at these risks and these protective factors in every assessment I conduct. Uh, I don't have a, a, a cheat sheet. <coughs> I don't necessarily create a checklist and go down and checklist each one. I've tried to do that and I found that it, it sort of derailed my history taking. Um, but I would encourage you to find a way to incorporate this, uh, particularly when you're evaluating uh, children, because this is not a test. <clears throat> this doesn't generate for the moment a score like our RISE does, which looks at a limited a number of, of protective factors and risks. But it does tell us something about uh, the potential uh, for us to help a child uh, and the number of protective factors that are in place. Ralph Lober in his research at the University of Pittsburgh years ago, looking at youth at risk for conduct disorder, uh, once told me that, <coughs> as I mentioned, uh, for every two risks those kids had, or every risk those kids had, I'm sorry, you need to find two protective factors. Look at some of these risks within the child. Females in our community are at greater risk uh, for mental health problems. Again, I, I'm offering no rationale or explanation. Perhaps we've ignored them. Perhaps we've, uh, as with learning disabilities, we've underestimated their needs. Or with ADHD, females are, are not as symptomatic. Uh, and thus, if you use a combined sample, uh, females with problems are less likely to be identified. Early puberty, a difficult temperament, temperament of those qualities children bring to the world before we have a chance to impact or influence them. And you're well aware, those of you that have been doing this for a long time, remember Stella Chess and John Kerry and, and their uh, temperament assessments. And it was very common for us to ask parents a series of questions. 
in an effort to determine whether their young child had a difficult temperament or a shy temperament. Um, and, and we would explain to parents that this comes in their biology and how you interact with them uh, will significantly influence what happens to them over time. Uh, my dear friend Wade Horn, years ago at the Children's Hospital in Washington, looked at children with difficult temperament and taught parents about temperament, not pathology, not mental health, not diagnoses, but temperament, and taught them about temperament and about their children's temperament and provided them with strategies to manage them. And years later, those parents still reported that the, the, the lens with which they were looking at their children, this temperamental lens, uh, was by far the most valuable thing they'd learned in trying to parent a difficult child. Uh, low self-esteem, uh, feeling incompetent, kind of the child that I tested this morning after I did that intake, <coughs> uh, as things got harder, uh, he wanted to quit. And when I asked him why, he told me that hard things were too hard for him to do. And when I asked him why, he was 13, this boy, uh, he said that's what he learned, that if there was something hard in school, he usually couldn't do it. That's a risk. Uh, anxiety or worry, uh, depressive symptoms or chronic depression, dysthymia, insecure attachment. Uh, those of you that are fans of Bowlby and attachment know full well that if you don't have a charismatic adult in your life, if you don't have someone you feel attached to, uh, you're likely to struggle. There's poor social skills and, and this insatiable need for approval and social support. Here are some protective factors. High IQ, uh, positive social skills, uh, a willingness to please adults, religious affiliation, uh, and I'm not proselytizing, but belonging to a group is protective. Uh, here's some in the individual. Uh, some uh, further more, and, and at this point, I've got 23 minutes in this talk, so I'm just going to jump through these. <coughs> Most of you can read them and understand them. Favorable attitude towards drugs, meaning uh, you believe that uh, drug use is, uh, is something to do. Um, early substance use, uh, brain injuries, traumatic brain injury is a risk for adversity. Uh, marijuana use, uh, the time will tell whether our increasing legalization of marijuana uh, is a good thing uh, or not a good thing. The argument that it's less harmful than alcohol, as far as I'm concerned, isn't a good argument because uh, maybe alcohol should be uh, equally restricted. Um, and then exposure to other toxins. Uh, there are protective factors. And, and look at that last one, engagement in activities that connect you to others. Uh, a, a large study looking at children's social media use, young teens, um, by the, uh, I forget the foundation in California, found that if teens were on social media uh, with friends, people they saw on a regular basis, that was a protective factor. But if teens were on social media with people they never met, that was a risk factor. Here's risk within the family. <coughs> Certainly poverty <coughs> is a risk. Disordered at home. Uh, early studies of young children find that their cortisol levels are very reflective of the level of disruption at home. Uh, extended uh, elevated levels of cortisol. I wrote an article about this. Uh, it's on my website and it's published in Autism News. Elevated levels of cortisol cause all kinds of risks uh, downstream. Uh, and you, you, there you see a, a whole host of risk factors, many of which we can do something about. You know, we can do something about a home discord. We can do something about child rearing practices. Uh, and then here are some protective uh, factors. Uh, and again, uh, shared activities, <clears throat> uh, a way of parenting that we sometimes, uh, when you look at different kinds of of uh, parenting styles. If you remember the research on parenting styles, <coughs> uh, there's a style that's uh, more interactive, uh, authoritative, and there's a style that's more uh, directed, authoritarian, and there's a style that's uh, more uh, laissez-faire or, or undirected where kids pretty much do what they uh, want. But when you look at these protective factors, 
often in the children you'll evaluate, uh, you'll find lots of risks and few protections. Uh, and many of these are things we can do something about. Here's uh, factors in peers. Uh, again, um, <clears throat> limited exposure uh, or exposure to high risk groups and protective factors in peers and factors in the school and community. <laughs> if you look at the school development program uh, at Yale, uh, very clearly their efforts to go into low income and high risk schools uh, and uh, build in efforts at uh, protective uh, factors, making the school a safe environment, involving parents in school activities, uh, pays significant uh, dividends. You know, the question is, can we create experiences in children's lives that will nurture these instincts? In other words, it isn't so much about I'm going to teach my child how to be optimistic, but rather I'm going to try and create and engineer experiences <coughs> so that uh, the instinct of optimism will develop over time. And if a child has risk and struggles, I need to be aware that that uh, flame of optimism could be easily extinguished. And how will I engineer that child's life? Because most of the kids I work with who spend time in a resource room are rarely come out of their time in that room on a daily or yearly basis and thank everyone for the experience. It's just the opposite. Uh, they see themselves as less capable, less functional, less smart, and they're often less optimistic. Joe Torgensen's research on children with reading disabilities found that by second grade, uh, if their reading problems <coughs> have not been addressed, children with reading disabilities develop a new problem. They develop a, a, a less optimistic, uh, in, intrinsically unmotivated uh, attitude in which even when you put good instruction in front of, in front of them, they fail uh, to participate. Um, here are uh, five strategies uh, that I think we need to think about as we look at teens in particular. Again, I, <clears throat> this is a short presentation. Um, <clears throat> it's not one size fits all. Uh, but these are five strategies that I picked up by looking at the, at the risk and resilience literature. Um, you know, declines in risk taking often means uh, that the share of students who take no risks has increased. And we have to create environments in which uh, being more cautious and not taking risks, delinquency, substance use, sexual acting out, uh, bullying, <coughs> in which uh, there's not only support, uh, but a community-wide uh, attitude and belief uh, uh, that these are important things to do. I think we have to create targeted efforts to reduce risk in, in, in uh, students who have multiple risks. Um, <coughs> in a number of studies, <coughs> for example, uh, looking at youth who end up uh, in the juvenile courts, a significant percentage of the crimes in juvenile court uh, are committed by a tiny percent of the youth in that system. That is, most youth who end up in juvenile court, the experience is sufficiently adversive uh, that they don't go back. Uh, and we have to identify those kids who are at uh, highest uh, risk, because when you have one risk, uh, it, it's equally likely you'll develop another risk. And when you have two, <clears throat> the chances of injury three or four um, goes up quite a bit. Um, I think we have to create uh, opportunities for risk-taking students. Uh, there are programs in a number of cities, they call them midnight basketball, open gyms, supervise them by volunteers, police officers in the evening, uh, giving uh, particularly inner city youth uh, a place to go and reduce the, the risk-taking behavior. Um, and I think we have to get ways of reaching them in non-traditional uh, settings. You know, can we uh, put them to work? Uh, can we, uh, as with uh, some of the juvenile court programs, drug court, can we find alternative ways 
of diverting increasing risk. Uh, and in particular, Hispanic students. Uh, my understanding of the research is among all the minority groups, uh, risky behavior among Hispanic students, <coughs> and you can go look at it for yourself, uh, seems to be uh, higher than in other groups. And when you look at uh, some of the national longitudinal studies, if you look at on my website um, under my <coughs> PowerPoints, uh, the talks I've done on the rise, where I've summarized uh, these large longitudinal studies. Uh, Hispanic students, the trend of uh, reduced risk and more protective factors uh, doesn't seem to hold true for Hispanic students for reasons that um, are unclear. Uh, here are two programs I really like. Uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with BAR. Uh, BAR is a nonprofit uh, SEL uh, program. The website is there. There's a description of their eight interconnected strategies uh, for educators, but it works for, I think, for any institution. Uh, you can see their uh, classroom strategies, but uh, you can see the uh, focus on professional development, on giving teachers the opportunity to receive support, uh, on uh, identifying and understanding students at risk, on involving families. If you're not familiar with BAR, I would encourage you to take some time to take a look at it. I really like what they have to offer and their resources uh, are free. You can, you, know, you can download and use their materials. And then the assets program, uh, which was developed by, uh, which started by just a youth worker, um, his name escapes me at the moment in the 1950s <coughs> and now has become uh, the Sitch Institute and the Developmental Assets Framework. There are 40 positive supports uh, I think offer a wonderful foundation. It doesn't mean that you have to focus on all 40 with every child, but it's interesting if you're working with a youth and, and struggling somewhat to make change, um, to get them uh, to develop the insight uh, or the willingness to change their behavior. I will pull out the assets framework and it, mentally go down and ask myself which of these does this kid uh, possess and which ones are, uh, am I focusing on and what am I missing? So the assets framework can really help in a counseling uh, situation. Um, <clears throat> this is our take, Bob and I, uh, the mindset of a resilient youth. Again, a mindset <clears throat> is a set of beliefs and attitudes uh, that you use to drive <clears throat> behavior. Uh, kids who are resilient or even adults are optimistic and hopeful. <clears throat> they recognize that others uh, appreciate who they are. Uh, they learn how to set goals. They see mistakes as challenges to embrace rather than obstacles to avoid. Uh, they know how to set problems or solve problems, and they set out to do it. If you remember Nowicki's <clears throat> internal locus of control, uh, just uh, two days ago I had a discussion with a teen about their locus of control. I like introducing these concepts even to latency age kids just to see how they respond. What do they, what do they say <coughs> when I uh, define locus of control and ask, so where is your locus of control? Do you think the world uh, directs and controls you? This particular child, uh, when I asked him to give me a percentage, told me that 99% of what happens to him was controlled outside uh, and 1% was inside. So obviously uh, that child's uh, perception of the world around him will need to change if he's going to deal more effectively and responsibly uh, with his problems. And finally, the last one is a belief. Uh, and belief's a valuable ally, even in the absence of fact. Uh, and, it, and it isn't a blind belief. Uh, when the fact's on the table, you have to shift your beliefs. Uh, but it's starting out uh, uh, appreciating that the unknown uh, might be defined, that the outcome uh, might be something you could define. And kids with worry, in our program here at, at, at our center, uh, we define anxiety as a lack of confidence in predicting outcome. And we help kids uh, more reasonably appreciate uh, whatever problems they're facing and what uh, uh, probability or possibility there is of making changes. And sometimes there's uh, unfortunately little possibility and one has to face that 
adapt as well. And finally, empathy, uh, which I think is uh, critical in our relationship uh, with ourselves, with important people in our lives, <clears throat> and with everyone uh, and with everyone else. Bob and I uh, talk about it as compassionate uh, empathy. So what do we know about this research on resilience? <clears throat> that when kids develop interpersonal competence, when they're exposed to supportive and consistent care, uh, these experiences buffer them. And, and we're seeing today more children with more problems. I talked about this in the first part of this series. Uh, the incidence of depression is higher <coughs> in adolescence uh, than ever before. Every generation has higher risk health and mental health. And the answer uh, to that uh, isn't, oh, we're making them uh, sick because we're not treating them, but rather uh, the world is a place where if you don't have uh, this kind of support and care uh, and you don't develop a certain attitude and belief about yourself, as stresses come your way, and they will, uh, you're less likely to be resilient. And the pathways that lead to this are complex. So there's not a single formula. Uh, and with kids I work with, we'll talk about these variables and ask them to define their formula. For resilience and for some kids it's helping others and for other kids it's their sense of humor and for other kids it's their they feel like they're good problem solvers but we need to do a better job of mapping these factors we need to do more studies that look at gene environment interaction we've yet to really look at how different alleles or different combinations of genes uh, interact with the environment we're doing it with drugs now some of you are aware that uh, certain genetic alleles preclude people from responding well uh, to certain kinds of psychiatric medications. And increasingly, as that is becoming an accepted practice, uh, physicians are relying on those tests to decide what type of antidepressant or what type of related medicine uh, to prescribe if medicines are used. We need a broader cross-cultural perspective, understanding how different cultures uh, contribute, although resilience is clearly uh, a species uh, a specific, not a cultural specific phenomena. We need to know about individual dispositions and temperaments, and, and again, how families uh, impact children's outcome over time. We know they do, uh, but we've yet to define uh, all of the variables that predict how and when they do. Uh, when we do this, then we'll better understand how the young of our species uh, survive and thrive. Uh, this is a, a time uh, unlike any other. Uh, yes, there have been other stressors uh, beginning in the 30s with the, you know, beginning in the, 20, in the teens with World War II or uh, the Great Depression or, or, excuse me, World War I, the Great Depression or World War II um, or other adversities, uh, but none like this one. Uh, I, the question is what kind of a lasting impact will this have? and how will it shape a children's mindset? Uh, as Neil Postman has written, and I've commented before, children are messengers we send into a future that we can't imagine. We couldn't imagine uh, what is happening in the world today, even a year ago, or even uh, three months ago. Um, uh, in mid-February, I was at the National Association of School Psychology Conference. There were thousands of people. We were at a conference like we are every year. It seemed very normal. And look at how different things are now. And I think you have to have a learning to swim mindset. Uh, if a child struggles, you don't just throw them in the deep end. You work with them. And slow is fast enough. <coughs> Some kids just need more practice uh, to build proficiency over time. It is the mindset that I use with all children, no matter how impaired they are. And my axiom is that if we're smart and ethical, we can help kids uh, be resilient, uh, develop educational proficiency, uh, 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 foster self-discipline uh, without stealing away uh, dignity and hope. In the last couple of minutes, I just want to uh, uh, briefly introduce you to what the next talk will be about. Um, and this is a slide many of you know uh, my colleague and dear friend, Bob Brooks. Bob and I have been working together over 30 years. Uh, and we were supposed to do a joint talk together in Canada, uh, actually this week. Uh, and 
of course that was canceled. And this was the slide that was gonna introduce us. Um, until I started writing it down, I didn't realize how many books we'd written, textbooks and trade books, <coughs> our documentary, our audio, uh, our parenting program, um, and, and dozens of lay and trade articles. Uh, we did write the first trade book uh, about uh, resilience. If you haven't looked at our play therapy book uh, that we co-authored, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at it because it's, uh, it's a book of strategies to work with kids uh, in therapy. If you haven't seen our parenting program and you're working with parents, I think it's a reasonable program to look at. Uh, it's one that comes from a resilience framework and uh, not a reward uh, punishment uh, framework. Um, and, and so just to introduce the next talk, uh, Bob and I spent the last couple of years trying to decide what we wanted to do next. And we began focusing on this idea of learned behavior <coughs> versus instinct. And we began looking at the <coughs> evolutionary research on instinct in human beings. And after much time, we identified seven, seven human instincts uh, that we want to make a case for, uh, define who we are as a species and why we are who we are uh, and why we are so different from any other species on this planet. And in fact, <clears throat> uh, any other hominid species that likely uh, ever walk this earth, uh, the last uh, who died off probably five to 8,000 years ago, the Neanderthals. Why are we here? What is it that's different about us instinctually? And have we lost sight of raising children? Uh, again, this tabla rasa view. And should we be <coughs> taking a view that as parents, we create experiences for our children in which these instincts can be nurtured and developed? So we've called these instincts uh, tenacity. Uh, and we've defined tenacity uh, as it's traditionally defined, perseverance, doggedness, patience, endurance, stamina, sticking with it. <coughs> but we think these seven instincts uh, drive that kind of uh, tenacity, uh, that kind of behavior uh, in our children. And uh, just to show you uh, quickly, and then this next talk in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna spend more time on this, but we think these instincts uh, provide the mental and emotional fuel that drives resilience, that drives self-discipline, and in fact drives acquisition of knowledge, drives how we deal with the world. Uh, they are intrinsic motivation. Young children are motivated from the inside out. Two-year-olds wanna help cook and clean and drive the car. <clears throat> we think it's cute, but in fact, it is their uh, internal uh, motivation. They don't need rewards uh, in order to help us. Uh, they're optimistic. They think they can do it. Uh, we will talk about a practical intelligence or simultaneous intelligence, uh, which uh, I will define further uh, and has epitomized uh, the work of, uh, of uh, J.P. Das and Jack Naglieri, among others, um, in, in defining what is intelligence really about. Compassionate empathy, virtuous responsibility, uh, genuine altruism, uh, and measured fairness. Uh, and in our next talk, I'll define these, um, and Bob and I will begin releasing some uh, short pieces about these to help you understand uh, why we think you should be thinking uh, this way. I think a tenacious mindset is comprised of these seven instincts, but for them to develop and flourish uh, requires us. Uh, that these genes for complex human behavior will not uh, develop absent a push from the environment. They are no different than speech. They are no different than socialization. If the environment doesn't provide opportunity, uh, the genes uh, languish. Uh, I've just about exhausted my time. As always, if you have questions, you can uh, uh, send them to Laura or to Matt. And with the last set of questions, I responded and they were posted, <coughs> I believe on the WPS site. Uh, there's my website. I have a monthly article. If you wanna uh, subscribe to it, I won't send you any advertising. Uh, if you do forensic work, I do write uh, short pieces for forensic and neuropsychologists as well. There's my email if you wanna 
write me directly. Uh, my uh, Twitter and Facebook and my TED talk that I did seven years ago on uh, the power of resilience uh, and our clinic. Um, I appreciate the time you've taken today to listen. Uh, I hope uh, you've learned something that you didn't know. If I attend a presentation and I leave with one or two things that I can put into practice that I didn't know, like the bar resources or the asset program, uh, then I think my time is well spent. So thanks very much and I will turn it back over to Matt. Thanks, Sam. Excellent job, great information. So happy to have you on board with these talks and with the WPS. Thank you all for attending. Just really quickly, you will be getting some emails from WPS that will include links to all of these assets, including the webinar, um, and then also the actual slides that Sam presented. In addition, we'll be following up with all of the questions that you asked. Sam will answer them personally, and then we will send them out and post them to our telepractice page, which you will also receive a link to. So thank you all very much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. We know that you have lots going on, um, and we look forward to seeing you again at the next talk for part three. Thank you so much.